welcome friends to CNS series of interviews from the Third Asia Pacific Feminist Forum or APFF 2017 being held in Chiang Mai, Thailand. APFF 2017 is organized by the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development or APWLD. In this episode, we are in conversation with Sita Mark of Cambodia who is a women rights activist and currently serves as the coordinator for the Worker Information Center, which is a member of the United Sisterhood Alliance, better known as US, in Cambodia, dedicated to address the needs of the people, in particular women and the marginalized people, and to realize social development and justice in Cambodia. Sita works basically with workers of garment industry also. Sita, how is the current neoliberal agenda of governments affecting realization of the sustainable development goals and gender justice? I think we, we, we ran um, a small workshops yesterday discussing how um, neoliberalizations and um, also patriarchy system actually impacts on the rights of women. Um, we try to look at that, um, how the social traditional cultures determine and define the role of women um, in the family and in the society. Um, and that um, role has limits um, the, the women into a um, leadership position um, and into more active in <clears throat> social change and being the actors. Um, with that, so when the neoliberalization has been actually adopted, it's kind of like um, somehow using that um, perspective and social norm and um, um, as part of um, the system to to actually trying to exploit the labor and also um, um, the leaderships um, of the women. How do we actually see that? For example, um, uh, um, what we have also seen, like it's always the perceptions that women's doing sewing work in the family. Mm. And, and because of that, um, they tend to see that this is the work that is not being so much value um, because it's part of the job of the women doing in, in at home. So th that's why there's a lot of um, discussions that the garment industry, the textile industry and the women who are sewing in the factory are the unskilled labor. So we are challenged that and unskilled laborers, you know, in this industry, that means you have to have cheap, I mean, work in a very cheap labor in, in terms of wage and other stuff. So um, with, with that thinking, um, we actually can see that um, the, the understanding of how the women's role and responsibility and functioning um, in the societies and in the family has become actually an advantage when it comes to um, 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 trade, investment and economy development. So um, for, for us as a women, um, I think this is really um, need to be a big change because why we we said that um, women are um, really value and the work that the women do in this industry is really important because they are not unskilled labor, they are skilled labor because they are produce, producing the branded clothes. You can't sell, <laughs> you know, that clothes in a export value if it's not being, do, you know, being done well. So I think it's a, a whole part of how we can see that. Um, and um, link. Um, the second, why am I choosing in terms of um, saying about cheap labor because this part of the um, um, neoliberalization is um, one of the things in that um, um, system and structures about competition and when it says about competition they often talk about cheap 
product and cheap product it means cheap labor so then and and this industry for example um, it's it's actually um, employ majority are women and majority of them are migrated so and we all know about migration issues you know um, of course they can earn better than they are living in their home rural area but it's still they earn less than the people who are living in the city because they are migrated they don't know the city very well and it's also um, um, living in an area that they are not really actually familiar before and it's also prone to um, exploitation and another safety and security issues so it's part of like the whole things that we are um, looking at how to ensure that um, the mechanism are in place for the women to really um, feel safe and secure and in the condition where they work um, at the decent you know uh, working um, condition and um, earning um, the decent wage and live with dignity. This is part of the things that, um, and we haven't actually really seen that system of neoliberalization had done that so much, you know, for women. Despite majorities of women has been actually um, had um, um, drawn into this um, kind of like um, uh, systems and economic model. So you were talking about, you took the example of the garment industry and you have been working with, uh, I've been done a lot of work with women in that industry. Would you share a little bit more about your experiences uh, and the problems which the women in the garment industry are facing? And also you talked about migration. So uh, these are the women who are migrating from rural to city areas for that work, mm -hmm. that is, uh, migration within the country which is happening. Could you speak, tell us a little more about these garment workers? The Worker Information Center has been working, um, you know, um, as an, um, an association since 2009. But before that, we are we one of the project of Women Agenda for Change. So we've been working with the um, workers in the garment, you know, textile industry for quite a long time. Yes, um, these women, I mean, um, the women worker are majority migrated from the rural area to the city. Um, many of them actually drop out from schools to seek jobs so then they can actually contribute economically to their own family. Um, at the same time to um, earn a living for themselves. And the factory job is their first job. And majority of them are actually migrated, um, you know, like about 90% of them are migrated from a different part of the country. And um, currently about 90% of them are women in this industry. It doesn't mean that there's no male, but mostly are, are women. And um, many of them come to the cities their first time. So, um, and they are hoping that they actually could, you know, work in the factories, get earning, sending money back homes, and also, you know, can also actually live a life and continue their own um, journey someday. Somehow they end up, you know, in the factory that the working condition is not really actually um, standard. They have to work long hours, 8 to 12 hours a day if they do overtime and um, 6 days a week. Um, somehow with um, low wage, even we recognize that our government um, lately has been, um, I think since 2014, the government had initiated a tripartite, you know, um, uh, negotiations for minimum wage. So since 2014, the minimum wage has been increased every year after the, the, the um, um, stakeholders had the meeting. Um, however, um, their living situation has yet been really actually um, going better because every time the minimum wage is increased, the cost mm. is also actually increased um, in terms of rent room fee, in terms of 
um, waters in terms of food and other you know necessary that they need for their living um, so and on top of that the working condition is also going worse why am I saying that because the targets getting double and um, they need to work over time um, and also most of the factory are also actually kind of like um, reinforcing the use of fixed term contract so in this way you know the the women get to work whatever the demand from the factory because their job is insecure so if they are not doing um, the work that actually being demand in the factory whether it's target or over time they they feel like they're gonna face you know termination of their contract so um that's the situations that's um, um mainly uh, about 700,000 of the women workers in this industry. Yeah. Uh, could you please share some of your success stories? There must, be, there must have been some sparks of success um, in that formidable atmosphere you are working in. Uh, and that is what gives us more hope. So could you please share some of the success which you have got? Yes, definitely. If we don't have success story, we wouldn't be actually exist until now because hope is the the one and the only things that keep us, you know, um, going on and um, um, continue our journey in in this um, work. Um, like I have mentioned, there's been um, a struggle. I mean, when the industry was started, the wage was just forty dollars a month. And it's keep on for quite some time, and the increasing is very small. Um, however, we can see that the the voice of the worker has been heard, um, even though it's come with a cost. You know, there's always um, a challenge where the work has <coughs> the worker has to come um, for strike and bringing up their voice. Um, anyhow, their voice has been heard. And uh, we can see, like I shared earlier, about the minimum wage that keep increasing. Um, so um, that's one of the story where um, workers um, actually coming with the collective effort. How do we actually contribute to this? Um, our work, we are running um, a drop-in center where we call it like a safe space for women to come together. Um, like I mentioned earlier, majority of them are migrated and they are not having all the time in the factory to actually connect and talk because they have to really, you know, work mm -hmm. and work fast. So we create this um, space for them to come together so they can be connected, they can be sharing, um, you know, how things, you know, um, going on in the factory, how things going on in their living area, what are the challenges they, they face and they exchange that and what they can do together on the challenges and difficulty that they are facing both inside the factory and outside the factory. On top of that, we also actually, this space is for them to actually access to information, for example, in terms of get more about the labor law, the, uh, and any other awareness related um, reproductive health, and also um, other related laws and policy and regulations around um, workers' rights, women's rights, and um, um, also as a citizen so then they can actually be part of the society because they are playing significant role in our country despite you know people see them as worker but this industry actually contributes significantly to our national economy it's been annually contributing 10 percent of the, you know the GDP and the volume of export is quite you know like around 80 percent come from this um, industry and aside from they are playing significant in this national economy, they also play a significant role in their family economy and the neighborhood. Because wherever they are, they are actually paying for the rent fee, buying the water, buying food and stuff like that. So they, they, they are, which is our government also say, the women and this you know, um, worker are the backbone of the economy. Despite that, they are not really yet living in a good conditions. And um, the society, as well as the state, need to really actually um, take um, seriously um, 
into consideration on how to provide protections and safety and security and ensure that um, all of these women are living in a good condition. So what we work is about creating that space for them to also exchange the experience, learning, at the same time collectively take actions um, when the issues um, in the factory and also in the living area come. Um, for example, um, we have um, taken up an issues um, in the living area when the rent room fee was increased mm. um, so they they couldn't you know pay anymore so they approach and then we create that space we facilitate them to discuss why and how things like that and what they want to do together with the landlord or with other actor similarly with other issues related to electricity access to electricity um, so that's how, and, and there's many um, success stories around that. When they come collectively, they have the power to negotiate. They have the power to dialogue. They also have the powers to also engage with the local authority as well. Um, and another actually um, um, things that we uh, take up on, we also actually engage in some of the factory case too. Like I think um, in the 2016, um, there is a case where um, one factory that the worker had been put into um, like suspensions and only pay for the 50% minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So after some time, you know, they cannot survive because even with 100% of wage, they can not still survive, but 50% is really very difficult. But they, they, they try to survive with mm -hmm. that for some time, but until they cannot do that anymore, so they come together, um, discuss about the issues, and we create that space for them, we facilitate and do analysis together with them and take approach from there. So engaging with different actors, and there was a response you know, from the buyer mm. In, in a way that they are actually involved and engaging and um, discussing with the factory and the factory does, you know, do the compensations mm -hmm. back to the worker for the whole like nine months that they've been actually um, paying the worker for 50% uh, minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So this kind of like success story is kind of like keep it up. We, we have some more. Um, mm -hmm. However, for us, this success um, to keep us that um, momentum, at the same time we still want to take a step where we really want, um, you know, um, the change in in a way that's not look at only case, but really kind of like uh, taking to account to ensure that these type of situation are not happening, like the violations of workers' right and labor law is not happening. And the labor standard will be applied and re, you know enforced in the factory, and also to ensure that the access to basic services for 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 the women worker are there. Um, and um, I can say that, despite some challenges that we are having, like we are facing right now in Cambodia politically, um, I still um, can actually say that we are also um, um, pleased with. Um, the Cambodian government, especially recently our Prime Minister announced things about um, um, the access for free healthcare for the women worker mm. starting from 2018. Mm. And also the regulations of the water you know, um, fee um, f um, for the, the worker. And, and also trying to set up or um, closer clinics, like you know, set up the clinic that close to the factory because they couldn't actually, you know, go to the um, hospital where the National Social Security Fund has been um, um, partner or having the agreement because it's too far from their mm. factory. So they often use private clinic mm. and that's actually very, very costly. Mm. So we can see that these move, you know, of, of the um, government to some extent respond and we can see that the, the voice and the workers' um, voice has been heard and considered. Mm. Uh, however, we need to also continue to monitor that whether it will be happening and whether the women worker will have all of those access. And at the same time also we are, um, the worker, you know, um, 
will work closely with the local authority to ensure that you know those services will be provided um, and the women will be protected um, yeah I think uh, what are the minimum wages now um, this year is 153 dollars yes per month. dollar per month and then this time of the year um, the tripartite negotiation will start also to discuss about the increasing for next year um, however, I think what from our experience of working with the workers and also in this industry, we are keen and very pleased to hear about the minimum wages increase. However, we try to challenge about this neoliberalization that one of you know the things is about privatization. So give so much power to the private to make decision so that's why you know the cost of living has been always increased so even if the wage has been increased it doesn't mean that you know the the living standard of the worker has been really improved so we we hope that um, the government will look more in terms of how to regulate the cost of living or to ensure that you know what would be the minimum price on on a, a certain com, you know commodity or necessary you know um, stuff for the workers to live so then because they have the minimum wage but the price of the yes. commodity is not minimum is always kind of like rise up so how would we keep up with that living standard and you know live with dignity and, and that um, sense so for us we also try to look at the whole um, system and and find find a way that um, everyone who benefit from these industries and can take you know um, pride of the national economy grow take a very responsible and accountable role to ensure that the people especially the worker who are playing significant significant part of that are being protected and their life have been you know um, lift up their, their situation has been really actually considered seriously. So that's, that's um, the way we are actually trying to um, uh, focus on. Sita, what do you think needs to be done more for gender justice? So that it, is it a distant dream or do we expect to uh, expect that it becomes a reality? At least we are all hoping that it becomes a reality. But what needs to be done more for that? I think that is a big question. Um, we have to have dream, and we always think that and hopes and vision that our dream will come reality. Uh, maybe it's in within our time, or maybe within the next and next next generation time. So I I still believe that that reality will actually would come. Um, however, the effort has to be really kind of like very strong because what we see now and what we also hear in the past, it hasn't been realized. Um, we still struggle um, as um, women. And, um, you know, when we talk about gender justice, for me, um, working in these areas and as a woman and working um, with a lot of women, um, we take a feminist approach why am I saying that because there will be no justice if we're not talking and discussing about the power relation and dynamic of the actors so here we talk about males and female when it comes to gender but it's go beyond male and female you know so we try to look at um, whoever the actors that are playing, we try to kind of like um, challenge the dominance of powers and ensure that there is a space and a models of collective powers so that every voice can be count, so that every um, 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 identity has been actually included in the process because we are very, very different. Um, um, so, um, for us is until we recognize you know and celebrate our differences and ensure that everyone you know voice and present are there 
um, it's very hard for us to you know materialize justice um, and it's also about um, creating the space for also um, um, acknowledging that we are human we made mistake so um, and because sometimes I think um, whether within our family or within the society we have a very descriptive of justice mean and um, it's al always come with um, punishments and things like that and people cr it's create more fear we definitely have a certain thing a certain actions to to be taken when something's went wrong at the same time there should be also a consultative process in that action taken and at the same time also acknowledge that people make a mistake and people can change and how our family or society create that space for people to to have you know um, a space for admitting the mistake and acknowledging it and then learn the lessons and support them, um, each one of us to you know um, to make change and to learn from those mistakes and, and I think that's um, easy to say than done but that's how I see you know justice can be um, happening because we can't make everyone the same and um, we can see that it's a mistake that we're trying to create system structures and practices to make people the same and it's become very forced you know um, forceful to do things that against the will of the people so until we you know create that a different um, environment and a different space and atmosphere to make people realize and be themselves and realize that they are part of it despite their difference and ensures that everyone count and everyone are motivated and support each other it's very difficult for us to to get there but i hope that we will get there because there are community you know experience it and maybe we just go out there and learn from that community so that's family or that society and promote it some more yeah i think you're very right sita when you talk of justice like justice is not about punishment justice is about achieving equality and uh, that that punishment aspect should not be there very often be related with justice uh, that, that that's a very apt remark and my last question now sita what does apff mean to you and to the people you work with yeah this is my first time participating in the asia pacific feminist forum for me it's means a lot because you find a space where you have a lot of people who are struggling with the situation where you are also struggling one is you are not alone so you feel like um, there are a lot of people out there two it's not that the struggle that you have you have hope you have success story and you have been gone through so far you know from the situation where we were um, facing and we make a move and there are success stories there's some changes we know that the struggle is still continue but at some point it's a space for us to celebrate success and to also feel connected and move together again in the future. I think I really value such a space. And that's the same thing that we are creating at our drop-in center. It's about the space because women connected, women in solidarity and support would give us a lot of inspiration, motivation, and also persistence. You know, kind of like you can keep on your your movement, your action, your journey, because you know that there are people out there, especially there are sisters out there who understand you, who will be there with you, whether by their presence or their spirit. And I really value, you know, this space in, in that sense. Thank you, Sita, for finding time to be with us today. Friends, you were listening to Chan Sita Mark a women's rights activist from Cambodia and coordinator for the Worker Information Center in Cambodia, with whom Citizen News Service was in conversation with at the Third Asia Pacific Feminist Forum or APFF 2017, 
which is being held in Chiang Mai. APFF 2017 is organized by the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development or APWLD. For more details, be welcome to check out APWLD's website www.apwld.org or visit CNS at www.citizen-news.org. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.